Absolutely. So uh, today I have the honor to present Dr. Wessel, who's going to talk to us about uh, continuous IV heparin in aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, so Dr. Wessel got his, uh, his undergrad degree at, at Wisconsin, then went on to get his MD at George Washington University. Then he became a resident at uh, Maryland, uh, in Maryland at the University of Maryland, where he did also a neuroendovascular fellowship. Uh, after he was done with residency, he joined Mayo, Florida to, as an associate surgeon uh, to do another fellowship in uh, neuroendovascular procedures. Uh, you can see down there a lot of his honors and awards that he has obtained throughout his career. And then next we have a couple selected publications which you can see that have had a, an impact in the literature as reflected by his H index right here and his citations. So we are very honored to, to have him talk to us today. And we are very honored to have him as part of uh, Mayo in Florida. So thank you, Dr. Wessel, and we'll leave it to you. Thank you, Andres. And, and at a personal level, it's been an absolute pressure to work with Dr. Wessel. And you've been an amazing, you know, an amazing team member, a gifted surgeon, I've seen you do more than just uh, endovascular, open vascular, but also other disciplines from brain tumors to spine. And it just, you know, it's always amazes me. You're not only your composure, but your level of maturity that you have in managing and interacting with all the team members. So thank you, Aaron. You know, on behalf, I know Chris and, and, uh, and, and Ravi feel exactly the same way about you. You know, so thank you for being here with us. Thank you both for the kind introduction. It's, it's a pleasure. I'll go ahead and uh, move forward with the screen share here. And, and Aaron, just so you know, we have over 50 participants from nine different countries, including Brazil, Dominican Republic, Italy, Mexico, Nigeria, Oman, Saudi Arabia, Spain, and the United States. That's so, amazing. You know, amazing work that all of you guys are doing. Thank you. That's awesome. All right. So um, thanks again, uh, Dr. Q and Andres, for that kind of introduction. As, as you guys mentioned, I'm going to be discussing the use of continuous low-dose IV heparin in the treatment of aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is probably something not too many folks are familiar with. So I can um, enlighten you hopefully, uh, given some of the experience I've had over the last seven years in using this uh, treatment option in, in select patients. Just briefly, I'll uh, provide an introduction to aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage and discuss the secondary brain injury that's encountered by these patients. I'll talk about nemotipine, the uh, tried and true treatment for subarachnoid hemorrhage, and that will uh, lead me into a discussion of IV unfractionated heparin as a potential novel agent. I'll talk about the Maryland low-dose IV heparin infusion protocol. I'll review some of the clinical data, and then I will get into um, a discussion of uh, an ongoing randomized clinical trial. I have no disclosures. As many of you know, uh, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage is associated with a very high morbidity and mortality. It's often cited that approximately one-third of patients who survive the initial hemorrhage remain dependent, while another 20 to 30 percent who present with a low clinical grade will decline during their admission. And for those patients who survive the initial ictus of hemorrhage, uh, the onset of a delayed neurological deficit, which occurs in just under one third of patients, is a critical predictor of one's outcome. And for the sake of this talk, and in terms of some of the literature I'll be discussing, the term delayed neurological deficit is really a, a global term that refers to the neurological, the psychological, and the cognitive effects experienced by those who suffer subarachnoid hemorrhage. And there's a, a plethora of mechanisms involved in, in this process. This is a very busy slide, uh, courtesy of one of Locke McDonald's reviews, but just uh, that kind of highlights the complex nature of what happens after a subarachnoid hemorrhage occurs. You know, it results in initial tissue injury, from direct mechanical effects, but also, excuse me, it also triggers uh, a range of downstream 
central nervous system and systemic effects, including robust inflammatory cascade, resulting in the upregulation of cytokines and chemokines, cell adhesion molecules, you have disruption of the blood-brain barrier, activation of microglia, and uh, activation of endogenous vasoconstrictors. The, I think it's helpful to think of blood as um, you know, uh, somewhat of a neurotoxin. Uh, when an aneurysm ruptures, blood is extravasated into the brain parenchyma. And if you look at some of the components of blood, most commonly discussed are thrombin, fibrinogen, and various forms of hemoglobin. These agents are responsible for many deleterious effects, including neuronal death, neuroinflammation, edema, vasospasm, hydrocephalus, and even seizure-related activity. And uh, these products, thrombin, hemoglobin, and free iron, uh, if you look at the concentration of these products in the blood and compare them to LD50 of neurons, you know, that is that which is lethal to neurons, you can see that the concentration of these products in whole blood is many times greater than what is lethal to neurons. Just again, highlighting the potential toxic nature of blood products to neurons. And uh, you know, this may contribute to some extent to many of the secondary brain injury mechanisms that result. Another important point is the concept of microthrombosis after aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. Ultimately, you can have an increase in platelet aggregation, increase in thrombin, or excuse me, fibrin uh, formation, and increased coagula uh, coagulation activity, which then can in turn lead to delayed cerebral ischemia. As many of you know, uh, nemotipine is really the only pharmacological agent that has been consistently shown in randomized clinical trials to improve outcomes after subarachnoid hemorrhage. And uh, we showed that, you know, while nemotipine is effective, there's unfortunately a, a number of patients that may be sensitive to this medication, whether that be due to hypotension or gastrointestinal intolerance. And if patients are for one reason or another, unable to uh, maintain compliance to the scheduled dosing regimen of nemotipine, they suffer. Uh, this is actually an independent predictor of outcome, even when controlling for various confounding variables. And furthermore, in the British aneurysm nemotipine trial specifically, although nemotipine was effective in improving outcomes, you can see that among those who were treated with nemotipine, there were still many patients who suffered unfavorable outcomes. And I think this just highlights that there's much to be desired in terms of therapies for aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. And that leads me into my next discussion of unfractionated heparin. So heparin is a glycosaminoglycan composed of hexaurinic acid and D-glucosamine residues joined by glycosidic linkages. And unfractionated heparin, as opposed to low molecular weight heparin, is a heterogeneous mix of polysaccharide chains ranging from three to 30 kilodaltons. You can contrast that to low molecular weight heparin, which ranges from three to six kilodaltons. Heparin itself has the highest negative charge density of any biological molecule, which translates to a very high binding affinity for positively charged proteins. And greater than 100 heparin binding proteins have been identified. Heparin itself complexes with a variety of molecules, whether that be free hemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin. It can block the activity of free radicals and reactive oxygen species. It binds to chemokines and cytokines, imparting anti-inflammatory effects, and also antagonizes endothelin mediated vasoconstriction. So there's a very wide range of molecular targets and potential effects of heparin that may have therapeutic implications. This has been studied in animal models over the years. Uh, there's a rodent model of subarachnoid hemorrhage, which demonstrated that heparin was able to inhibit leukocyte accumulation in, in rat brains after transient focal cerebral ischemia and actually improved outcomes in, in these rodents as well. And additional work from the University of Maryland Medical Center uh, by my mentor, Dr. Uh, J. Mark Samard. Uh, he, he demonstrated with a rodent model of subarachnoid hemorrhage 
that heparin was able to reduce neuroinflammation in the form of reduced activation of microglia and expression of TNF-alpha and IL-1 beta, and also uh, was able to reduce demyelination of the perforant pathway, which was evidenced by greater black gold two staining of myelin, myelin after, um, after induction of subarachnoid hemorrhage. The concept of heparin being an anti-inflammatory medication is not a new concept. There's many papers, too many to cite, going back over several years, investigating uh, heparin as a potential therapy for many inflammatory conditions, including sepsis. There's been uh, descriptions of intravesical heparin for the treatment of interstitial cystitis. And heparin even uh, gained some interest uh, during the recent COVID-19 pandemic as a potential therapy. So this is not something new, but um, uh, you know, it's not really been discussed in, in terms of CNS injury uh, prior to this body of, of literature here. Um, I just want to talk about the Maryland low-dose IV heparin protocol. This was developed at the University of Maryland, and myself, many of the neurosurgery colleagues there and the neurointensivist team are, are very familiar with using this protocol. And this consists of the administration of intravenous heparin, uh, unfractionated heparin, that is, which is initiated 12 hours after securing an aneurysm with either clipping or coiling. And the heparin is initiated with, without the use of the loading bolus. It's simply started at a dose of eight units per kg per hour for a duration of 12 hours. Then it's escalated to 10 units per kg per hour for 12 hours, and subsequently escalated to a dose of 12 units per kg per hour, which is maintained throughout the duration of the protocol. During that time period, the goal is to maintain a PTT less than 45, so this, such that you don't have any uh, bleeding-related complications or uh, anticoagulant, direct anticoagulant effects. If the PTT is greater than 45, the infusion rate is decreased by one step in the protocol for 12 hours before attempting escalation to a higher dose. And this infusion is continued for 14 days after ictus at which point a CT angiogram with perfusion is performed. On that study, if there's evidence of severe spasm or spasm with a corresponding perfusion abnormality, infusion is continued for an additional one to two days. And then, it's, then you reassess the situation, oftentimes stopping the infusion if, if deemed appropriate. There was a, a preliminary study uh, describing the use of the low-dose heparin protocol published back in 2013 in the Journal of Neurosurgery. This looked at 86 patients with Fisher III subarachnoid hemorrhages treated with surgical clipping. All of these patients had anterior circulation aneurysms. The way that patients were assigned to a treatment group was done in a pseudo-randomized fashion. And what I mean by that is there were two open vascular uh, neurosurgery attendings, and it patient came in while one attending was on call, they went to the heparin group. If it came in, they came in while another attending was on call, they were treated with the standard therapy and placed in the control group. If you look at the 86 patients broken down by heparin and control groups, there were no significant differences in their baseline characteristics. This uh, plot demonstrates the distribution of PTT values, and you can see that Rarely is it an issue to have a PTT uh, maintained above 45. So no major issues in that uh, aspect of things. And I just wanna to touch on the management of neurologic declines as that's relevant to the clinical outcomes of the study. If a focal or a non-focal neurological deterioration suggested the presence of symptomatic basal spasm, IV fluid was initiated, if no improvement, was experienced vasopressors were initiated for induced hypertension. A CT angiogram uh, would be completed to confirm the presence of vasospasm. And if that clinical deterioration was accompanied by angiographic vasospasm and not responsive to induced hypertension, patients were treated with intraarterial vasodilator therapy or angioplasty. When looking at vasospasm related outcomes, heparin did not appear to reduce uh, the rates of angiographic vasospasm, but did, uh, there was associated with a reduction in rates of clinically significant vasospasm 
meaning those cases associated with a, a neurological decline. Heparin was also say, associated with reduced rates of infarction on CT scan. And when looking at rescue therapies for vasospasm, including the use of vasopressors or microcatheter-directed therapies, there were lower rates of, of these, both of these therapies um, among those who were treated with the continuous low-dose IV heparin. In this uh, small uh, subset of patients from this preliminary study, there were no hemorrhagic complications identified and no cases of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia or deep venous thrombosis. There's another study out of Europe describing the use of heparin as a potential therapy in, uh, for vasospasm. I like that they refer to it as an additional H. We all, all know about the uh, classic triple H therapy. Now, this study was a retrospective match paired analysis of subarachnoid hemorrhage patients can treated with continuous heparin after endovascular treatment of the aneurysm. 197 patients were treated with the IV heparin, while 197 match controls were treated with the standard low molecular weight DVT prophylaxis. There was a range in terms of how long patients were treated with the IV heparin, spanning anywhere from 24 hours to seven days. And these patients were matched based on a variety of pertinent baseline characteristics including age, their clinical grades, Fisher score, uh, presence of hydrocephalus, and need for external uh, drainage, among other factors. The interesting thing about this study is uh, the use of heparin, and particularly for greater than 48-hour period, was associated with reduced rates of severe cerebral vasospasm, uh, which is also outlined here on, the, on this bar graph. Heparin itself was not associated with a, a functional outcome. Uh, however, uh, the factors uh, that were associated with a favorable outcome on the multivariable analysis were young age and good clinical status. So we, at least in this study, we see an association with, association with reduced rates of severe vasospasm, but not any uh, significant change in outcome. As many of you know, uh, you know, subarachnoid hemorrhage has a significant impact on, on patients even beyond the hospital stay. There's often subtle cognitive and real world deficits that accompany subarachnoid hemorrhage, many of which can go undetected by uh, the gross neurological measures that we often use to assess outcome like the Glasgow Outcome Scale score, for example. Consequently, many of the patients who've been considered to have a quote, good outcome can continue to experience deficits in memory, their executive function, language, many years after subarachnoid hemorrhage and cognitive impairment has been reported in up to 70% of survivors of subarachnoid hemorrhage. As many as about 60% may not be able to return to work. So this, this is having a profound impact on the lives of patients even beyond the hospital stay for many years to come. There was a study uh, published in 2019 out of the University of Maryland and a few other centers, including the University of Louisville. Uh, this was a retrospective study. They looked at 47 patients treated by clipping or coiling. 25 of the patients were treated with a low-dose IV heparin protocol, and 22 were treated with a standard uh, sub-Q heparin, and the primary outcome was a MOCA score at, at greater than 90 days. Just a brief review of the MOCA. This is a Montreal Cognitive Assessment. It's scored on a 30-point basis. It's a quick test. It's administered in about 10 minutes. It assesses a variety of, of uh, functions, including short-term memory, visual spatial abilities, executive, executive function, attention, concentration, working memory, language, and one's orientation. This is a, a picture of the worksheet for the exam. It's something that can easily be administered by a nurse or a medical assistant uh, in the waiting room or in the patient room uh, as a, a, a patient's waiting for a visit. <clears throat> this uh, study comparing heparin versus a standard therapy found that patients who were treated with low-dose IV heparin had greater MOCA scores, and this was statistically significant. MOCA scores were on average 26 compared to 22. Serious cognitive impairment defined by a MOCA score less than or equal to 20. 
was uh, encountered in zero patients treated with the low dose IV heparin compared to seven patients who received the standard therapy. This was significant. There were no statistically significant differences in modified Rankin scale scores. And what this highlights is the potential um, uh, lack in, in ability, to, ability to assess uh, cognitive outcomes with some of the uh, traditional scales, such as the modified Rankin scale score, the Glasgow outcome scale score. Another pertinent point is that the time from aneurysm treatment to the MOCA assessment was uh, much shorter in the low-dose IV heparin group compared to the standard therapy. A multiple, multivariable linear regression analysis was performed as a, as a final part of this analysis. The low-dose IV heparin uh, was a positively associated with improved MOCA scores with a p-value of 0 0.019, while aneurysm location in the ACOM region along with fever were associated with worse outcomes. So while this is a small study and has to be obviously interpreted in that context, it at least is uh, quite thought-provoking and um, <clears throat> may provide some insight into the, the potential benefits of a low-dose IV heparin. <clears throat> and I, I just want to touch on uh, one of the main uh, studies that, uh, that I conducted, uh, which was kind of the culmination of all of this work. Uh, this was published in neurosurgery last year, looking at the use of the low-dose IV heparin infusion after aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. This was a retrospective study that looked at 556 consecutive patients over a 10-year period, treated with uh, clipping or coiling. 233 of these patients were treated with a low-dose IV heparin protocol, <clears throat> while 323 were treated with the standard low molecular weight heparin for DVT prophylaxis. As I mentioned previously in another preliminary study, the Treatment allocation was performed in a pseudo-randomized fashion, dependent on the attending physician that was on call. The analysis in the study looked at radiological and clinical outcomes data. We performed a multivariable logistic regression, which I'll touch on, and then a propensity score-based inverse probability of treatment weighting analysis. This uh, flowchart depicts the patient selection for the study, there were 771 patients admitted with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. 215 of those patients were excluded for a variety of reasons. That left us with 556 patients, 233 of which were treated with the low-dose IV heparin protocol, and the remaining patients received the standard medical therapy of the sub-Q heparin for DVT prophylaxis. <clears throat> this is a breakdown of uh, baseline characteristics. You can see that in the low-dose IV heparin uh, cohort, there were uh, basically a, a sicker a group of patients. 41% of patients had a WFNS grade greater than or equal to three compared to 32% in this, the control group. There were higher uh, Fisher scores among the low-dose heparin uh, patients, uh, lower rate of posterior circulation aneurysms, and a greater rate of uh, surgical clipping among the low-dose IV heparin group. Looking at uh, bivariate analysis of outcomes, <clears throat> low-dose IV heparin patients had a greater rates of uh, radiographic vasospasm when broken down by severity in terms of mild, moderate, or severe, but this was not significant when you compared severe versus non-severe vasospasm. There were lower rates of infarction among the low-dose IV heparin patients uh, found on CT scan. Multivariable analysis uh, was then performed to adjust for confounding variables. And this demonstrated that patients with the low-dose IV heparin uh, treatment protocol were 1.9 times less likely to develop delayed neurological deficits, 2.5 times less likely to develop cerebral infarction, and 2.2 time, times less likely to develop a deep venous thrombosis. The inverse probability of treatment weight analysis was then performed to give an unbiased estimate of the average treatment effect. And this uh, cut the patient group down slightly to 230 patients. This, this type of analysis is a little bit beyond uh, my scope of statistics, but the most important uh, point to take away is that this analysis 
an interpretation of the uh, estimates is only valid if there's no difference in the, the assessed baseline characteristics, which you can see is the case uh, based on the p-values of the um, in this table. This additional uh, multivariable regression confirmed that low-dose IV heparin, again, was associated with significantly lower rates of delayed neurological deficit, uh, lower rates of cerebral infarction, and again, uh, lower rates of deep venous thrombosis. So uh, reproducible after uh, matching based on propensity score. From this study, we concluded that uh, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage treatment with a low-dose IV heparin protocol following aneurysm repair is associated with a significant decrease in delayed neurological deficit and cerebral infarction. Obviously, there's some limitations of the study which have to be uh, taken into account when interpreting the results. The most uh, significant is that this is a single center study uh, with a retrospective design. There's a, it's, it's not uh, truly randomized in terms of treatment allocation. There's potential for bias. And patients who died early in their hospital stay were excluded because this oftentimes is due to a variety of causes, sometimes withdrawal of care, in terms of a family making a decision and how they wanted to proceed with patient care. Um, but nonetheless, I think in terms of a retrospective study, this was uh, quite robust. So where does that leave us? There's uh, been an ongoing randomized clinical trial. It's called ASTRO, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage trial, randomizing heparin. This is a multi-center prospective randomized clinical trial comparing low-dose IV heparin for a 14-day course with the standard of care. The study population for this randomized trial are patients treated with coiling, ages 18 to 70, with uh, minimal uh, baseline deficits. They have to have a WFNS grade less than or equal to two without aphasia, modified Kircher scores of three or four. Primary outcome in this study, which I think makes it unique, is, is a MOCA score at 90-day follow-up. They also look at uh, major bleeding events, which is everybody's concern when you say that you're administering IV heparin to patients after subarachnoid hemorrhage, and many of which who have external ventricular drains in place. And the secondary outcomes uh, of the study include whether or not low-dose IV heparin reduces blood and CSF inflammatory markers as sort of a proof of concept in terms of the anti-inflammatory effects of heparin. I just have to acknowledge um, a few folks that were very instrumental in some of the work that I uh, completed that I highlighted in this talk. That was J. Mark Samard, uh, one of my main mentors throughout the past seven years, really taught me how to uh, be a vascular neurosurgeon and take care of uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage patients. Rob James from University of Louisville, who's an alumnus of the University of Maryland. He's really been uh, driving things in terms of the randomized clinical trial. Matt Cole is the uh, fellow at uh, UT Houston, one of my good friends. He uh, was heavily involved in this work and many other uh, friends and colleagues from the University of Maryland and the University of Louisville. And with that, I'll wrap it up. Thanks again for your time and attention. Appreciate uh, the opportunity to share this work with you guys today. Wonderful. Thank you, Aaron. So I'm going to ask, um, I think that I see Chris and, and Ravi right here, maybe actually Tian and Dave Miller to see if you can help us lead a discussion. Sure, I'm happy I to. Uh, please, please go ahead, Chris. And I see yeah, already I'm Carlitos has a question as well. Go ahead. Go ahead, Chris, take it away. Yeah, oh, sorry, could you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. We're, you were muted okay. a little bit, but yes. And I, I just pointed that Carlos, Carlos has his hand up as well for a question whenever you're ready. Go ahead. All right, yeah, Aaron, thanks so much. That was a phenomenal talk. Really nice job kind of distilling the data. Um, and uh, you know, for me personally, it was nice to get a little more depth on this. I'd, I'd heard some of this through um, Dr. Adam Polifka who you know, trained at Maryland and who uh, worked in my previous at work. So uh, a couple of questions. I, I may have missed it, but I didn't see any. Was there any data on um, increased hemorrhages um, with, in patients with EVDs? You sort of mentioned it there at the end. Uh, and then, um, you know, my second comment is, 
you know, it, it, there, there's so much going on in subarachnoid hemorrhage. Obviously, we haven't really advanced the science all that much in terms of vasospasm over the past many decades. So uh, with, with data like this, that seems pretty compelling. Um, why do you think it hasn't caught on more, um, you know, kind of across institutions? Yeah, um, <clears throat> to address your first point, I, I touched on it with the preliminary study. There were no, uh, there was no increased rate of hemorrhagic complications. I didn't mention it from the larger study published in the Red Journal that too uh, didn't find any difference in hemorrhagic complications. Um, you know, I think uh, you're just touching on, uh, you know, some of the uh, treatment options for subarachnoid hemorrhage and. And what makes heparin unique? One one aspect is it really isn't targeting vasospasm; it's targeting the inflammatory response. And um, I think one of the contributing factors as to whether or not you know why this hasn't caught on is it's early. I mean, I think I I understand the hesitation uh, in folks not wanting to do this until it's truly proven in a randomized clinical trial, and I th I think that's appropriate, which is why we had one neurosurgeon who did not use this protocol and another neurosurgeon that did. Um, many folks are concerned about uh, hemorrhagic complications despite us finding uh, no difference. But uh, you know, I think it's, 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 uh, it needs to be proven in a randomized clinical trial uh, to really uh, get traction. And so I don't know where things stand with the study. That's I know that uh, enrollment was temporarily paused just early this month, but they plan to resume. So. It'll be very interesting to see where things come with go with that. Uh, great talk, Aaron. Um, I have two questions uh, for you, basically. Where do you see this going personally? And what do you personally think the mechanism here? Many, you know, many medications that have been tried uh, over the history, especially in subarachnoid hemorrhage, you know, did not stand the, the, the witness of time, basically. People try them by principle, it makes sense. And then you don't find out that they, you know, they do what you expect them to do. Otherwise, sometimes you find out something does something that you didn't expect and it works. Um, where do you see it personally working and where do you see this, you know, five and 10 years from now? And for what reasons? Sure. I, my, my personal thought is, is the key determinant and either the gateway or the roadblock for this is gonna be the randomized trial. I mean, my, I personally am comfortable, you know, in terms of the safety of this treating patients, but when I go into practice, I'm not gonna do it unless it's proven in the randomized clinical trial. You know, um, I think that's, that's the appropriate way to go. And also it's, it's, not, uh, it's not without potential um, challenges uh, in, among nursing staff, you know, you have folks running a continuous infusion for 14 days, checking PTT values, asking you, the PTT value was 46. What do you want me to do with this? You know, now it's 48. So there are, there's a whole educational process that's required among nursing and the ICU team um, to, uh, to, to do this without substantial um, uh, difficulty. And in terms of the mechanism, I'm, I'm, it's not clear. I mean, we, we know that heparin has some anti-inflammatory properties and uh, uh, like uh, my mentor, uh, Mark Samard has demonstrated in rodent models, there's anti-inflammatory effects and potential impact on demyelination. Um, we, we've tried to look at um, uh, the development of cerebral atrophy after subarachnoid hemorrhage, which we know happens. Uh, it's been documented and trying to compare that you know, among heparin versus control patients. The challenge that we encountered was that you really need a good base baseline imaging study to get the baseline cerebral volume. And that's, uh, that prevented us from, from uh, completing that study. But to really answer your question, I, I, you know, I don't think it's entirely clear. There needs to be more, to, more work uh, to figure that out exactly. If it does turn out that, that this stands the test of time with the randomized trial. <clears throat> and, and last question, what was the reason for temporary holding enrollment? That, that I don't know. I haven't spoken to Rob James, who's the, uh, leads the study. I just, just, I just found that out. It was just paused uh, March 4th, I believe. 
So I, I don't know exactly. I, I'm not sure if it's because he switched institutions from, from Louisville to Indiana or, or something like that, but that's just uh, postulating. I, I don't know exactly. Thank you, Aaron. And maybe I go to Carlos, Dr. Perez, and then Dr. Dagi. You know, Carlitos, you wanna go ahead and ask your question and then we're gonna go to you, Teo. Absolutely, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wessel. A very interesting discussions and, and findings. Um, I had a question regarding uh, the length of the stay of these patients. For example, when, when they are ready, I know these are very complicated, complicated patients, but when they're ready for discharge before they till 14, do they usually stay in house to finish the protocol or they can be discharged and then come back for the infusion therapy? So uh, <clears throat> most of the patients end up staying for 14 days unless they're very unique, uh, low grade subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, and we, we, at some point, maybe day seven, say that, you know, this patient is, is really at a low risk of, of clinical decline. But in general, in general, patients get a 14 day course. Um, they're also treated with nemotipine as, as, which is the standard of, of care. So, um, to answer your question. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Aaron. Dr. Daggy, Professor Daggy, who's also a faculty member in our department and who's going to be visiting us pretty soon in person. Go ahead, Theo, please. I thought this was a really great talk. Just two things. One, when you do the study, especially the um, randomized study, I think the question of difference in cost, the outcome economics, is probably going to be very important to uh, incorporate into the study because it's going to be asked. Second point, which is the question, is can you, can you hear me okay? Can I can hear you. Okay, yes. great. Yes. Second question is um, the effect of, he of heparin on the endothelium and the effect of the subarachnoid hemorrhage on the endothelium. Mark Mayberg, almost a generation ago, brought the idea that vasospasm really should be thought of as an endothelial event as opposed to an event elsewhere in the artery. And the question of the use of VHAM inhibitors on the endothelium came up. So not only general anti-inflammatory, but specific anti-inflammatory for the endothelium. Has that work progressed at all? And is heparin one of the ways in which that could be modulated? I'm not sure if that work has progressed. We, at least at, at the University of Maryland, haven't looked at specifically the effects on the endothelium. Um, but you know that's a, that's a really good point. Um, that, that would certainly be a, a very interesting aspect of this to, to investigate further and may shed some more light on the potential uh, mechanisms that are relevant to this disease process. That's a great talk. That was, that was a very difficult synthesis. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And then I see Dr. Freeman. Are you still there on the line? And then I'm going to ask Dr. Fox to wrap it up. Dr. Freeman, I saw a comment from you. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I enjoyed your talk, Dr. Wessel. I think uh, heparin, as you nicely articulated, is you know, at the low dose, uh, works on antithrombin-3 and is, has an anti-inflammatory role. And SH disease is very complex, too. I mean, it's large vessel, small vessel, microthrombosis, and uh, intense inflammation. Uh, we studied uh, the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, which... You know, I wonder if those pathways might connect, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious if, um, you know, the neuro and vascular team would propose we um, you use some of this low dose or try to join the trial when, when available. So thanks, Dr. Rose. Oh, can, I just, can I just piggyback on that quickly? So I think, uh, Dave, so that's what's exciting to me. So You've got, uh, it looks like a nine site clinical network. Two of them are in Florida, University of Florida in Gainesville and Tallahassee Neurological Clinic for Astro. But if we could understand why the, you know, the enrollment was suspended and this is designed as a phase two. So it looks like their target enrollment is 88 patients. They don't say how many they've accrued to date, but even if they're not in a position to add a site, if it is positive and they go to phase three and they need a larger network, that would be an opportunity for us to participate 
And instead of wondering about what the best approach is, we contribute to the science to determine what the best approach is. Totally agree. That is awesome. I'm so glad that you come in on that, Dr. Barrett. Beautiful. Dr. Fox, you want to bring it, uh, wrap it up, you know, the whole, you know, situation and, and uh, bring some sense of uh, closure to a topic for which there's no closure, of course. That sounds like um, about as tough as getting started in clinic on Monday morning. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a tall, tall order. Um, but I, yeah, I mean, I, just to, to summarize, I, I think, uh, you know, Aaron, Aaron did a great job and the talk was um, uh, completely in keeping with the work that he's done this year. He's been a, an amazing addition to our team. As Q mentioned at the beginning, um, a very thoughtful and, and, and mature guy who's destined for, for great things. So I, I think with, um, with subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, you know, there's, again, as, as I mentioned earlier, there's so much out there that we don't understand um, and we just haven't, haven't figured out. But I, I remember hearing about this data early on um, and, and being very intrigued by it. I think it's something that, um, you know, I'd, I'd love to see it sort of um, spread to a, a wider trial. I can certainly reach out to Rob and the Rob James. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know specifically why the trial was halted, but again, he did change institutions, so that may be why. But um, but we could take a look at this and, and, and see how we could get involved. Um, and uh, I think, you know, anything we could do to, to try to improve outcomes for this very difficult patient population would be great. I mean, I, I often feel that, you know, when, when patients have a great outcome after subarachnoid hemorrhage, we're, we're frequently patting ourselves on the back, but it may just be the patient's physiology and not so much us. And so it'd be really nice to, to figure that out in, um, in more detail in an incremental way. So, but uh, I, I really don't have anything uh, otherwise uh, to say <laughs> other than thanks. Thanks to Aaron. It's, it's, uh, you know, I'm glad we still have you for another few months, but um, it's been been an awesome experience to have you here this year and keep up the great work. And thank, thank you, Aaron. And thank you, Theo, for your question right then. I saw Aaron already answer right away about the biomarker. So amazing talk, wonderful to put all this in perspective. And so thank you. And, and Theo, just remind us, when are you gonna, are you gonna come and visit us in person? We're gonna have you have uh, meetings with a lot of people. When are you coming? I'm coming Wednesday a week. A week from a Wednesday, this coming Wednesday. Of, Excellent, excellent. So yeah, so that people, and we're gonna start putting some meetings for you on the books with everybody. That is great. And I'm really looking forward to meeting with everybody. Good, I, good. I, I, I will, cannot I, tell you, I cannot tell you how excited I am about this. Great, I would love for you also to meet with Dr. Barry, who's a shared neurologist, who is very tight with us and also with Dr. Boo, because we have this new enterprise work that we're doing, Kevin, Boo and myself to bring neurology, neurosciences, neurosurgery here in Mayo, Florida, and the enterprise to the next level. So we'll organize. I saw Kevin already saying hi right there on the picture. So good. All right, everybody, have a great week. Great talk. Congratulations to everybody. Enjoy your week. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah.